Good afternoon. If you'd rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you. And welcome to this joint opening session of the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and Groundwater Protection Council. I'm Hal Fitch. I'm the director of the Michigan Office of Oil, Gas, and Minerals. And I have the honor of serving as the vice chair this year of IOGCC and also a member of the executive committee for the GWPC. This is really a great opportunity for all of us here to finally be in one place together, talk about ideas and issues that we're all dealing with. Today we'll hear about states working with their federal counterparts and we'll hear about what states are doing to continually provide outstanding environmental stewardship through innovative programs and sound practices. We have a full program today, so I'd like to get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's our great privilege to have with us today, Mayor Mick Cornett, the first four-year term mayor in Oklahoma City history. Mick is the son of a postal worker and a school teacher. He was born and raised right here in Oklahoma City. From an early age, his parents taught him the value of public service and, and encouraged him to keep the faith, work hard, and dream big. He's leading this thriving community that reflects those same principles. Mayor Cornett earned a degree in journalism from the University of Oklahoma and an MBA from New York University. He's been honored by various organizations and publications as, one of the, as the top mayor in this state and nation and by an international panel who selected him as number two among the best mayors in the world. Newsweek magazine called him one of the five most innovative mayors in the United States. So let's welcome Mayor Mick Cornett. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Down for Thank, you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Oh, that was a, a good. I didn't know you all were going to be so rowdy, though. I, a little bit concerned we may have to bring out some more police reinforcement this week to handle our not to not to protect you from our citizens but to protect our citizens from you guys H how many of you here have been to oklahoma city before this trip how many of you have not been here before and have no idea who i am many of you well um when we have guests and visitors we like to give them a little bit of primer on oklahoma city's history because it is unique you have heard the saying, no doubt, that Rome was not built in a day. But we were, quite literally. On a spring day in 1889, the federal government held what they called a land run. Now, a land run was a fairly unique idea at the time, but basically they lined up the settlers and they fired off a gun and the settlers roared across the countryside and simply put a stake in the ground. And wherever they put that stake was their new home. Citizens got together, and they elected a mayor. And then they shot him. <laughs> yeah, that's not that funny. <laughs> but I uh, appreciate the feedback. It lets me know what type of audience I'm dealing with as I get started. The city of Oklahoma City, and really the state of Oklahoma, from the earliest days, had an economy that was based on the price of commodities. And so early on, it was the price of cotton, and later the price of wheat, and ultimately the price of oil and natural gas. And when you have an economy that's based on commodities, what happens to your economy? Well, it goes up and down with the price of the commodity that you're referring to. In fact, it, it's interesting, if you look at Oklahoma City's history, it's hard to ever find a year that was average. It seems like it was either the best of times or the worst of times. And we were going through one of those stages in the 1970s and 80s. The 70s was kind of a booming time in the energy business. You may remember, price of oil was going up and up and up. We thought it would last forever. And then what seemed like on a single day in 1982, we had a shopping center bank, Penn Square Bank, failed. And by the end of the decade, over 100 banks had failed in the state of Oklahoma. Our energy businesses were in shambles. Our banking system was almost non-existent. Our commercial real estate industry was at, at a bottom. 
And by the end of the decade of the 1980s, Oklahoma City probably had the worst economy in the country. But we had a business-minded mayor named Ron Norick who eventually turned things around. He passed an initiative called MAPS, Metropolitan Area Projects. And if you're around Oklahoma City very long, you will hear that term used over and over again. Interesting to note that MAPS barely passed in 1993. And today you can hardly find anyone who will admit they voted against it because ultimately it would change everything. It took us a while to get on our feet. In April of 1995, we were struck with the largest act of domestic terrorism in the United States history. 168 of our citizens were murdered at nine o'clock on a weekday morning. But it's amazing to see what has happened since then. And if you take a snapshot of this city, in the days and weeks following the bombing. I think it's almost as symbolically that the people of this community grabbed hands, pulled each other up, and dared the world to pull us apart. Because there's been more unity in this city than in any city you can imagine. And it's been our secret ingredient to coming so far, so fast. Today, it's largely considered we have the best or one of the best economies in the country. We have about the lowest unemployment rate. Highly educated 20-somethings are moving here in record numbers. Our population growth is double its traditional average. In one sense or another, this seems to be the best of times. One thing that does seem to be a little bit different, even though the price of oil now is roughly, what, half what it was just over a year ago, you don't see the construction projects and the plans that were on the drawing board come to a halt or stop completely. It seems as if our efforts to diversify the economy over the last 20 years have taken hold, and today we have considerable investments in the biomedical sector, in aviation, and certainly in tourism. And that's where you come in. We're glad to have you here. Uh, please take some time to visit Bricktown, visit the National Memorial, and if you have any issues while you're in town, all you have to do is turn to one of our citizens and ask for help. You need to borrow a quarter. You need directions. And if they look at you funny, just say, well, the mayor said you'd help me. <laughs> it works every time. Glad to have you here. Thank you. And I hope you'll return to your home and tell people what a great time you had in Oklahoma City. Thank you, Mayor Cornett, for that warm welcome. Um, our current chairman, uh, Utah Governor Gary Herbert, uh, was not able to join us for this conference. He did, he did want to leave an address for us, though. And uh, if you'd uh, join me, we'd like to uh, hear a few words from our chairman. Hello, this is Governor Gary Herbert. I would like to welcome everyone to the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission's annual conference, where we are celebrating 80 years of service as an advocate for states as regulators of the oil and gas resources within their borders. The IOGCC, which is the longest running and most successful interstate compact, exists by virtue of a constitutional authorization that permits states to join together for the common good. In this case, the common good is the conservation of domestic energy while protecting the environment. Despite challenges throughout its history, IOGCC remains a working laboratory for innovative public policy and continuous regulatory improvement. The past year has witnessed its share of challenges for our states, both in terms of battles over regulatory authority and dealing with a sharp economic downturn in the oil and gas industry. Even though the EPA recognizes that methane emissions have fallen by 35% since 2007, they have advised us of their new plans to cut methane emissions even more. Last meeting, I announced Utah's participation in a case against the BLM as it attempts to issue new regulations regarding hydraulic fracturing on public lands. States, as usual, have been quick to respond. Since our last meeting in my home state of Utah, the IOGCC has continued to build the, quote, state's first initiative, unquote, alongside 
the Groundwater Protection Council. Today you will hear how these two remarkable organizations have repeatedly succeeded in utilizing the state strengths and are indeed showing that states, not the federal government, are the first to respond both to issues and opportunities. A showpiece of the state's first initiative is FRAC Focus, the world's leading forum for the disclosure of chemicals in hydraulic fracturing fluids. But the good works of the initiative are only getting started. Now underway are programs to improve the skills of oil and gas field inspectors, a process to offer states consulting services on various regulatory needs, and the release of a new guidance publication on how states can address challenges of induced seismicity associated with oil and gas operations. These have all come together in the past year. IOGCC and GWPC will continue to bring the states together and set the world standard in regulatory development and implementation. As I turn this chairmanship over to a great energy leader in Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon, I will continue many of the same objectives and goals in my new position as the chair of the National Governors Association. While we continue to win the battle that tests our ability to effectively regulate the resources within our borders, let's seek first an agenda for resource management that serves the public well by ensuring that domestic oil and gas is fully utilized and waste minimized while adhering to the world's model for environmental protection and compliance. I challenge you to personally join with us in these efforts and to support our incoming leadership in the important work of the IOGCC. I thank you for the opportunity I have had to serve as your chairman and wish you the best. Well, thank you, Governor Herbert. I'd like to go on now to introduce our officers for 2016 for the IOGCC. First, I want to introduce our 2016 chairman, Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon. Is Governor Fallon here? <laughs> In uh, 2010, Mary Copeland Fallon was elected as the, as the first woman governor of Oklahoma. Since then, she, uh, excuse me, she took office in 2011, and Oklahoma has consi consistently ranked among the top states for job creation in the nation. Prior to serving as governor, Ms. Fallon represented the people of Oklahoma in a number of state and federal positions. She served two terms as state representative before becoming Oklahoma's first Republican and first woman lieutenant governor in 1995. After serving as Lieutenant Governor for 12 years, Ms. Fallon served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2007 to 2011. As the former chairman of the National Governors Association, Governor Fallon led a nationwide initiative, America Works, Education and Training for Tomorrow's Jobs, seeking to better align education with 21st century workforce needs. And now as only the ninth governor in our 80 year history of the IOGCC to serve a second term as chairman, let's welcome Governor Mary Fallon. Hey everybody, welcome. Thank you so much, Hal. I appreciate that very kind introduction. And thank you for serving as the vice chair of IOGCC. We appreciate your leadership and appreciate you being here. And I'm also very excited. I haven't got to see him yet. David Porter, who's our new incoming vice chair. Is he here somewhere, David? He's here. He's here somewhere. But anyway, I look forward to working with you wherever you are. Anytime you get Oklahoma and Texas to work together. In fact, I wore this color today just for all of our Texas people. I understand there's been a little bit of something said about that. Actually, just was by coincidence. But thank you so much for being here. And, and what a great video Mayor Mick Cornett showed. Did you guys enjoy that? Isn't that wonderful? Very proud of Oklahoma and Oklahoma City. And I have to say, there's just a cool factor 
about Oklahoma City, so I hope that you have an opportunity to be able to spend some time seeing the great city, and, and of course, we're very proud of our energy sector in our state and all that's done to enhance our quality of life and certainly our economic situation here in our state. So we're very proud to have all of you here, and welcome. I understand this is the first joint session, a very historical conference and getting the IOGCC together along with the Groundwater Protection Council and also the National Rural Water Association to come together in one joint meeting to talk about very important policy issues involving not only energy, but certainly our precious resource of water itself in the same place at the same time. So it's a great opportunity for all of us to be able to work together. You know, there is one simple truth that I think we all need to remember and understand as we begin this conference, and that is good energy policy makes for good environmental policy. Good energy policy makes for good environmental policy. And having responsible production of oil and natural gas certainly means that we want to be responsible with the protections of our environment and other precious natural resources, as I mentioned, our, our water. So it's fitting that we're here, but it's also necessary that we all be good advocates of being good stewards of our land and our water and our air, and certainly taking good care of our natural and wonderful resources that we have in our great nation. And by being here, that's what you're doing here today. So thank you for being here at this conference. And I also want to recognize our uh, Canadian friends that have joined us here. All of those of you from Canada, will you just mind raising your hand? Say welcome to United States, welcome to Oklahoma, glad to have you here. We also had our Canadian Council General who had joined us here today, Sarah Wilshaw, if she's still here. There she is, great to see you again. She was here two weeks ago visiting with me officially, so wonderful to have our Canadian friends here that has so much in common with the United States and, and certainly a great ally and great neighbor of the United States. And all of our out-of-town elected officials and guests have joined us here today. Welcome to our own Oklahoma Corporation Commission, our commissioners that are here today, uh, Commissioner Anthony and Hyatt and Murphy, we appreciate your leadership, and my Secretary of Energy and Environment, combined two positions, Secretary Mike Teague is here, Colonel Teague, also was here earlier, there you are, good to see you too. So I appreciate all your service in helping get this conference here. And then, of course, our IOGCC Executive Director and Chairman, uh, we, excuse me, our executive director, Mike Smith, we appreciate Mike, great to see you as always. I know Mike, I said earlier, 35 years, he said, we're not that old, but I've known him a very long time, but Mike's a, a great person, certainly does a wonderful job. And I have to say to Governor Herbert, I appreciate him doing the video today. He was not able to join us here in Oklahoma, but I've known Gary Herbert well over 15 years. We both served together as Lieutenant Governor and, and now as, as governors, and he's very passionate about the energy sector, very passionate about the environment, and certainly a great leader when it comes to public policy and, and advocation of, of good good policy for our nation. So we appreciate him being, being uh, here with us and sharing his leadership with the IOGCC. I noticed, uh, I don't know whether you caught this or not, and I was sitting there thinking about this. He talked me into once again coming back as a chairman of this group, which I'm thrilled to do, because I believe in it, I think it's very important. But I just finished a term as national chair of the Governor Association, he just took over. So we're switching places, it seems like, because he just became our national chair of the Governor's Association. So it's fun to see him. Maybe we'll get him back to do this again in this job, who knows? But anyway, we appreciate him, and thank you for all that he, he does too. You know, I was reading about your mission statement, which I think is very, very important, and I'm just gonna quote what it says. Without energy, the quality of life we enjoy today would not exist. It just wouldn't exist. And that's such an important mission statement. If you think how far we've come as a nation because of energy, whether it's our quality of life, whether it's our economies, whether it's our industries, whether it's our national security, Without energy, our quality of life would not exist as it is today. And at a time when we see so many people that at times demonize our natural resources, demonize especially oil and gas, it's important to remember how important the energy sector is to our way of life, to our quality of life, to our business community. And certainly 
having affordable energy is very, very important, not only to our citizens, but it's important to our businesses and our industry. It's important to our fellow nations that join in with us and have to have that affordable energy also. And so it's important not only for that, but as I mentioned, for our national security, that we do have responsible domestic oil and gas production expiration. And I think we are, as we all know, moving closer to, to North American energy independence as we continue to develop new innovative ways to produce oil and gas. And, and certainly we're looking forward to seeing the new innovation that comes out of this little bit of a downturn that you just mentioned, Hal, a few moments ago that, uh, and the mayor did, that we're going through right now. But supporting our energy sectors is very, very important for our way of life, for our quality of life, and for our energy. And so we all know that energy is not a luxury. It's frankly just a necessity. It's a necessity for us all. It helps us provide for our food, for our housing, certainly for our jobs, for health care services. I mean, there are so many different needs to have energy in our society. And that's why the work that IOGCC does is so important. It's also important to be able to balance the multitude of different interests through sound regulatory policy. No doubt, it's always challenging. There's a lot of different groups, interest groups, media, different uh, people that we have to balance what's true, what's factual, and what's scientific as we deliver sound policy, and especially to work with our lawmakers as a private sector, as policymakers, to be able to make sure that we're doing things right for our nation and to be responsible in what we do. But as I mentioned, we all want to be good stewards of our land, water, and air. And certainly, it's very essential that we want to take care of our water. Because if we don't have water, it's hard to produce energy in our nation. And so that's why it's so exciting that we were able to bring the water component here together to work to make sure that we're doing things the right way, not just doing things, but doing things the right way in our nation. And so by bringing these groups together, we're certainly strengthening our conservation programs, working among our states, and certainly working among, with our friends in Canada. We're also helping with research and coordinating best practices. We're also working with our partner agencies to be able to conserve our environment, but yet also protect other resources such as our water and to also talk about ways to be responsible in how we dispose of excess water when it comes to energy, which is certainly a big topic in Oklahoma and other states around our nation. So once again, that brings us full circle to good energy policy is good environmental policy for our nation. And so we're glad to have the different groups that are here today, and I look forward to, to working with you as your chairman over the next year and working on our water and energy mix where they come together to find uh, good collaboration, best practices, the best ideas, and certainly the best policy for our nation. In the meantime, as we finish this meeting, you got a great lineup of speakers, very important topics. You're gonna to have a, a wonderful conference. I'm gonna be back to see you on Wednesday. Go to all the meetings, enjoy them all. You're gonna find out a lot of great information, meet, meet a lot of great people. But in your spare time, when you don't skip the meetings, go out and see Oklahoma City Enjoy Bricktown, you're right, within walking distance of it. There's a lot of great restaurants and night spots, all kinds of fun sports activities, as you saw along the Oklahoma ri River. The, the, the weather is wonderful. Great museums, National Cowboy Western Heritage Museum, the Oklahoma City National Memorial, other museums in the city, the Botanical Gardens downtown. You got to see the Bass, I think, last night. Some of you went to the Bass Restaurant on top of Devon Tower. Beautiful view of Oklahoma City. It's a great time to be here. And then spend a little bit of money, because when you spend a little bit of money, you make me look better. So it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Welcome to Oklahoma. Glad to have you here. Well, thank you, Governor Fallon. And thanks for accepting one more term as the chairman of, this, of the IGCC. We look forward to another year ahead uh, under your leadership. Uh, and, and as our officer slate, Governor Fallon will be joined by Dave Porter, the chairman of the Texas Railroad Commission as vice chair for 2016, and Oklahoma Secretary of Energy and Environment, Mike Teague, as second vice chair. 
And with that, I'd like to turn the stage over now to our two leaders, Mike Smith and Mike Paik, who have a few words for us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Hal. Uh, we sure appreciate Hal Fitch uh, being first vice chairman of the IOGCC and, and uh, a long-standing member of the GWPC Board of Directors and currently on our executive committee. And I believe you've been on for a couple of terms, so we appreciate your leadership, Hal. I, um, I want to welcome, as, as the past speakers have, everybody here to Oklahoma City. Uh, I moved here 40 years ago. Uh, when I was a young man, and uh, I, uh, I occasionally, even now, uh, have people say to me, where are you all from? And that's after 40 years. And I apparently have retained my Wisconsin accent. I grew up in a little town just near Green Bay, Wisconsin, and those of you that know me know I'm a rabid Packer fan. But some, I, I'm, I, I'm quite certain the mayor left, but something that if I was introducing the mayor, I would have let off with is that Mayor Mick Cornett is also a rabid Packer fan, and to my knowledge, the only mayor of Oklahoma City who's ever been in Lambeau Field. And I passed him a note up here when he's sitting, and I said, go Pack, go, and he bumped me in the hip. So uh, I'd vote for him to, uh, whether or not he was a Packer fan, but he is a, well known to be a great Green Bay Packer fan. So. We're here today and it's a historic meeting, absolutely historic meeting. It's the first joint meeting uh, of the Groundwater Protection Council and the uh, Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Com Commission, and we're co-locating with the National Rural Water Association. All three of these groups are national groups operating in, in rural waters case, all 50 states, in our case, 45 or 48 states in the compact all the producing states, associate state members, and provinces of Canada. So the breadth of the three organizations is significant, but what I like to point out is all were chartered in the state of Oklahoma, and all have remained here and have their, their association headquarters in the state of Oklahoma. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, a, it's been an interesting um, uh, process to put this meeting together. Mike Smith and I were talking a year and a half ago, maybe, Mike, something like that, about wouldn't it be nice if, and the idea clicked with the both of us, and along about that time, uh, Sam Wade, who's the executive director of the National Rural Water Association, uh, uh, we, we three directors had lunch, and the idea came to pass that we would have a meeting focused on water and energy, and, and so you are here. Uh, the, uh, there's a, as I said, there's a long history between uh, the IOGCC and the Groundwater Protection Council, and it began when I was the associate director of the IOGCC uh, a long time ago, and I worked for IOGCC as associate director for about five years. While I was still working there, uh, a, a number of states, the oil and gas compacting states, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission was a lead in this, and there are a number of other states I won't mention, but the states came together within the compact and the National uh, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act was really gearing up for underground injection control. There weren't any rules or guidances out uh, yet. And in that program, there was a marriage of five types of, of underground injection wells, but the principal one, the one that, for which there are uh, probably the most active wells, in fact, there's no question, are the salt water or produced water disposal wells that we uh, inside, the, inside the business call class two wells. And so these brilliant states decided that they were gonna create a new association, kind of spinning it off from ILGC a little bit, but in their, in their wisdom, they reached out to the water agencies in the, the originating states. I think there were about 15 of them. They reached out to the water agencies that ran Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act programs, and they said, why don't we f come together and talk about water and energy? And I have to give credit to the oil and gas states. It was their idea, and it, they reached out, and they decided that to, in order to have an effective organization, that they wanted to deal with water and energy, that, or oil and gas and water, uh, they, needed, they needed the water regulators sitting in the same room with them in the, uh, uh, in the discussions. That was 33 years ago, and 
I was a, originally opposed to the creation of the Groundwater Protection Council as the young uh, second person in charge at, at the compact. And the group of states said, well, Peg, if uh, we understand, but why don't you just go off and run this thing for a year? It's going to collapse, and then you just hang on, hang on with G uh, IOGCC. That was 33 years ago, and I, I, haven't, had, I haven't had time to look back. Uh, the, uh, so we've been involved and engaged with the, the compact uh, for all of those 33 years and had some of our origin, origins out of, the, out of the compact states. Over all these years, I've, I was going to list them. There's really no point to it. We've done dozens and dozens of projects together, uh, too many to remember. The, uh, but maybe the most notable one that you all have heard of, and don't tell me if you haven't, is frac focus, and I'm going to talk a little bit about frac focus uh, later, so I, I won't uh, I won't go into that in any great detail. But it's um, it's it's a, a tremendous example of how uh, the two organizations came together to create uh, one of the the only transparency system for looking at the chemical use and hydraulic fracturing in the United States, and I give my colleague Mike Smith uh, half the credit for that. But maybe the thing that I'm most proud of, and this is the most recent, is the uh, tremendous uh, uh, or, uh, group organizations that came together and created States First. And again, I got to give half the credit to my co-board member, Mike Smith. And I think what you're going to hear this afternoon about States First uh, is, is should encourage you. Uh, we hope it enlightens you. Later in the program, you're going to hear a lot more about it. Uh, from from Larry Bengal, so uh, just really, really uh, encouraged by the, what we've done to this point and the potential for what states first can do. So th that's really the end of my remarks. But I did want to point out to you that in the agenda, you'll see that my name came first and Mike Smith's name came second. So I asked them a while back. I said, "So Mike." why don't you go first and I'll follow you? He said, no, 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 we're not doing that. He said, I'll follow you because I want to be able to rebut anything you say. <laughs> well, if you look at your program here, you'll see my picture in there and there's some lies about what I've done in the past or what I do and, and uh, uh, some of the other speakers. And I noticed Mike Smith's picture and bio is not in here. And I also know that he said he wanted to follow me so he could rebut whatever I said. So Mike, I prepared a list of notes and, and, and uh, I'm going to read your bio for the group and give, give the group some of the quotes that you've made over your career and then let you rebut those. No, not really. I wouldn't do that. So let me, uh, let me pass the gavel to my, my, my colleague and good friend, Mike Smith. Golly, Michael. You know, it is Mike and Mike in the morning show again, isn't it? Start off with the Packers. And look what he did. He gave me an orange piece of paper to a boomer sooner. What kind of a guy are you anyway? Well, I just want to add my welcome. Welcome to our hometown. As Mike mentioned, this is our hometown. And we are so thrilled to have all of you here. And you heard from the mayor and the governor. And we just... After the bombing in 1995, we were, I guess, at the lowest point in my lifetime here, and just the recovery we've made, and a lot of you in this room helped make that happen. Um, I am so excited about what I'm going to do, I'm going to move right to it and not say anything else other than to present the E.W. Marland Award. You know, E.W. Marland is a giant figure in the oil and gas industry. And he's even a bigger figure at IOGCC. His picture is right in the middle of our foyer, and it's in several places around the E.W. Marlin building, which is our headquarters building. Back in 1935, he um, was elected governor, sworn in as governor of Oklahoma, and he ran on really two platforms. He was going to create a highway patrol, which we didn't have, and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. And he and several governors got together and did that. And they, um, their foresight and vision, we now have every, as Mike mentioned, every oil and gas producing state. And several of our partners 
uh, from Canada who produce oil and gas are members of IOGCC, and a tremendous track record of doing those things that the governor talked about a few minutes ago. Um, Almost every year, we give our highest award in recognition of our founder, Governor Marland, to an outstanding state regulator. Uh, we've been doing this since 1994, and we've had several outstanding winners. Um, the particular winner that I'm about to announce, I think Governor Marland, if he were here, would be extremely, extremely proud of this year's winner. He uh, personifies the visions, the progressiveness, and the, the outreach that Governor Marlin had. And I'm just thrilled to announce this year's 2015 E.W. Marlin Award winner is our great friend, John Baza from Utah. I'm going to say a few words about John, and then I'm going to ask him to, to come up and, and say a few words to you. Uh, he's been the director of the Utah Division of Oil and Gas and Mining since 2005. He earned his bachelor's and master's degree in petroleum engineering from Stanford. Uh, he's a registered petroleum engineer in Utah and is a 36-year member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. His IOGCC participation has just been legion. He is one of our outstanding leaders and has been for many, many years. He's been official representative for Utah since 2006, and he served as our vice chairman in 2013. He's been with the Division of Oil and Gas in Utah for over 22 years. And 15 years of that, he has served as, or with the program and has assumed the role of director. He's worked yeoman hours and, and uh, all through his career has looked toward bringing the Utah community together, which uh, is very diverse, uh, and working with the states and, and of course our partners in our, our international affiliate. Uh, he's very involved in his community in Salt Lake and other places. He uh, does things as, uh, such as uh, assist children with special needs and families with a, a day of fishing, which is one of his passions. Um, he's a great sports fan, as any of you, as those of you who know, uh, uh, realize. He loves to watch baseball. He loves to... Uh, play some golf from occasion, and he's um, a huge fan of the Utah Utes, the running Utes. In fact, uh, as we thumb through, you will, uh, there he is right there on, the, this is the, this is the 2015 Utah Utes football team. <laughs> the best players are always on the back row. Boy, that's a young team you have this year, John. Um, I want to play another video that we have. A, a huge fan of John's was unable to be here, but wanted to send a congratulatory video to him. And if it's ready, we will go ahead and show the video. Hello, this is Governor Gary Herbert from Utah. It is my privilege to recognize one of the great public servants of Utah, Mr. John Baza. John, we are proud that the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission is recognizing you for your commitment to Utah with the E.W. Marland Award. Like Governor Marland, you provide the leadership and vision needed in the regulation of our state's resources. You have provided excellent service to the energy industry and continue to do so with a career that has spanned over 33 years. Your dedication to Utah's oil, gas, and mining division 
is only surpassed by your compassion for the community. We could not ask for a more driven and knowledgeable division director. He is, in fact, the consummate public servant. Congratulations, John, and thank you for your service to Utah. And thank you to our 2015 uh, chairman, Governor Herbert. A couple of John's colleagues have also sent congratulations uh, Mr. Michael Styler, who's the executive director of the Utah Department of Natural Resources, has sent a congratulatory letter that I'll, I'll present to John here in a few moments. And there was a special, special person that works with John, Erlene Russell, who was John's former secretary and really one of our very, very helpful co-conspirators in putting all this together, uh, Carol and and others, our staff at IOGCC have, um, have put, put this whole thing together with, without John's knowledge. And she wanted to send a personal congratulations to you, John, and, and let you know how truly blessed she feels uh, to have worked with you and call you her great friend. Well, if the big chief will come up this way. We will present him this year's award. John? expecting a one-hour speech. <laughs> <laughs> My trouble is I don't have a script to follow right now. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm so honored. I really am. I certainly didn't expect any of this. And uh, I think my wife has done a great job of keeping a secret. And I don't know, did you find some of those pictures? Okay, well... Anyway, it, I'm normally not at this much at a loss for words, but I know that any, any one of you that I've worked with over the years is just as deserving of this award. I appreciate the recognition. I appreciate my association with all of you good people because, frankly, you're the, one that, you're the ones that count. The people that we serve in our various states are the ones that count. And I think I saw a quote recently from, from Albert Einstein that said, the only life worth living is in the service of others. And I think any one of you could be up here being recognized at this time. I thank all of you. I appreciate the recognition. And, and I hope that I'm around for a long time because I know that some of these awards are given when you're at the end of your career. But. <laughs> I, I intend to be around for a while longer, so thank you very much. Well, congratulations, John. It's very well deserved. Uh, we'd like, like to take a 15 minute break now. When we come back, Secretary Teague will begin our water and energy panel. Thank you.